Good evening. Would you join me in our call to worship this evening? This is one especially for Monday, Thursday of Holy Week. When we get to your part up on the screen, it of course will be in red. Read that aloud together in one voice if you would. Come and remember the love of Jesus gathered together with his friends. Come and hear the challenge of his new commandment to love one another. Come and mourn the betrayal and suffering of God's own Son. Come and commit to walk in his footsteps as his disciples. Amen. Amen. Let me pray for our time together tonight. God, we remember tonight that your son, in an indivisible member of the Godhead with you, refused to pull rank and instead chose to step down into our experience and live among us as one of us, with all the struggle and suffering that goes with being human. More than that, he took on the role of a servant, giving himself completely to us and loving people of no reputation or social standing. As incredible as it sounds, tonight of all nights tells us that you are the God who serves. And we can respond in no other way than to praise you in wonder and commit ourselves to Jesus, the Christ, in love and devotion. Amen. Amen. Would you stand, if able, and join us in singing the first song? a place where mercy <laughs> reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide. Where all the love I've ever like a flood comes flowing down at the cross at the cross I surrender my life I'm in all of you I'm in all of you where your love ran red and my sin was white I owe all to you I owe all to you, Jesus. There's a place where sin and shame are powerless. Where my heart has peace with God and forgiveness for all the love I've ever found comes like a flood comes flowing down at the cross at the cross I surrender my life I'm in all of you I'm in all of your love ran red and my sin washed white. I owe all to you. I owe all to you. Here my hope is found. Here on holy ground. Here I bow down. Here I bow down. Here arms open wide. Here you save my
Let me read for you two passages, first from the Gospel of John, and then from Paul's letter to the Colossians. These, I'm going to refer back to these passages when we talk about Jesus tonight, as we lead in to observing the sacrament together. First, from John chapter 3. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Those who believe in Him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Now from Colossians chapter 1. God has rescued us from the power of darkness, and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Again, you can stand if able, and we're going to sing together hymn number 85. seated. Listen to a third text this evening, which I will also mention in a moment as we lead into the Lord's table. This is again Paul writing 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 to 8. Your boasting is not a good thing. Do you not know that just like a little yeast affects the whole batch of dough, So clean out the old yeast, that you may be a new batch of unleavened bread. For our Passover lamb, Jesus Christ, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the Passover festival together, not with the old yeast of malice and evil, 
but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Think of what you're about to hear as a sermon or a homily. Think about it as an extended introduction to observing the Lord's table together. You can't really understand Jesus, who he was, his purposes, and his mission without understanding the Old Testament. Jesus' first followers were, of course, Jews. Everyone who wrote a book in the New Testament was either a Jew or they learned Christianity from a Jewish Christian. And just like in our day, Jesus can be a befuddling, disorienting, confusing, and surprising figure, he was for those Jews in his day too. He didn't fit their expectations. He didn't fit the mold of what they thought Messiah would be. And so, like good Jews, what they did is turn to the Old Testament. And they asked the Old Testament to explain to them who Jesus was and what he was all about. What they were looking for chiefly were patterns that were repeating 
in the person of Jesus. Something that happened previously that now was being embodied by Christ. Or maybe a key theme in the Old Testament that then they can use to explain what Jesus is all about. For example, the Gospel of Matthew positions Jesus as the new Moses, the next Moses. The first Moses gave the law from Mount Mount Sinai to God's people. Jesus, acting like a second kind of Moses, sits down on a hillside and preaches the Sermon on the Mount. A new law for God's expanded new people. Paul talks about Jesus over and over again as the firstborn of the new creation, or specifically as a second Adam. Who was the first Adam? Well, the Old Testament tells you. First Adam is the place where humanity's story starts. Jesus is like a second Adam. It's where our story is restored and where it restarts. Well, when the Jews, who were the first Christians and wrote the New Testament, or their disciples wrote the New Testament, when they looked at Passover, they saw Jesus. What happened in the first Passover, for those of us who were just at the Seder dinner, you have that fresh in your mind. When the Jews, who were the first Christians, saw Jesus, they saw in Him what happened in the first Passover. The three passages I read for you previously in this service are three examples of that in the New Testament. First, John chapter 3, verses 16 to 18. The writer of the Gospel, John, says that the world is a condemned place. And it already was before Jesus got here. It is a sinking ship. It is doomed. In the first Exodus, in the first Passover, a lamb was sacrificed so that the people of Israel would be passed over and be spared the tenth and final judgment that was most climactic, that would ultimately free them from slavery in Egypt. When the first Christians looked at Jesus, they saw something similar at play. The world around them was a sinking ship, and Jesus was sent to be their life raft. The world around them was doomed, and God sent Jesus to them to give them a route to eternal life, divine life, something far better. The Apostle Paul writing in Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, the second passage I read for you, also envisions something about Jesus that is parallel to the Passover. In the Passover, we celebrate that Israel was freed or liberated from slavery. They were freed from a power that they themselves could not eradicate themselves from. Well, when Paul thinks about what Jesus does for us, he says, Jesus is like Passover. He frees us from the power of darkness and transfers us into the kingdom of God's light. This, he says in the next phrase, is redemption. You and I look at redemption on the page of our Bible and we think a word that's churchy. It was not 2,000 years ago. Redemption was a word from the slave markets of the first century world. If you were going to redeem a slave, what you would do is pay the bond, pay the bill that was necessary to grant that slave his or her freedom. And when Paul looks at Jesus... He sees someone who frees us, just like Israel of old. Frees us from a power that we ourselves cannot escape on our own or under our own power. Jesus is our Passover. Jesus is our route to freedom, to God's kingdom of light. 
In the third passage I read for you from 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we are told that Jesus is our Passover lamb and we should be like, in a really creative, imaginative turn of phrase by Paul, we should be like unleavened bread. That we ourselves who commit our lives to Jesus need to be like that matzah that is eaten at a Passover meal. How so? Well, Paul says we need to be unleavened with things like, here's the quote, malice and evil. If we're going to say that we follow Jesus, the Passover, who has led us to eternal life and in whom we begin to experience his kingdom of light, then there are behavioral and moral expectations of us. We need to be people that are free from the yeast of things like malice and evil. Imagine how inappropriate it would be for you to show up to a modern Jewish Passover and bring Wonder Bread, not matzah. It is exactly the image that Paul is painting in 1 Corinthians 5. It is inappropriate for you and I as Christian people to claim the name of Jesus and yet follow him in a way that says... We have yet to eradicate ourselves or free ourselves from things like malice and evil. Nope. Paul says, be unleavened bread. Jesus, our Passover, asks that of us. One of the great uh, studies of the sacrament of the Lord's table is by a New Testament scholar in America by the name of Ben Witherington III. And he goes through how our understanding of communion has changed over time. And one of his conclusions is we understand this best and with the most clarity when we understand its roots. This started as a Passover shared between Jesus and his disciples in that upper room in a in Jerusalem some 2,000 years ago. It was a dinner. It was about their relationship. And in the midst of that dinner, Jesus talked about who he was and what he had done and would do for those who follow him. The more that we stray from understanding this as a Passover, the more foggy our understanding of this becomes. So tonight, as we celebrate the sacrament together, all I want you to do is remember that Jesus is your Passover. And this we celebrate together. Let me uh, invite you here to the Lord's table with these words of welcome that come to us from one of my favorite books of liturgy by Jan Richardson called The Painted Prayer Book. Let us bless the bread that is given to us both with its terrible weight and its infinite grace. Let us bless the cup poured out for us with its love that drenches and makes us new. Let us gather around these gifts simply given yet immeasurably valuable. And let us hear the call of this bread and cup to carry grace and love to a hungry world. Amen. Let's pause, and I want to pray for our celebration of the sacrament together, and I am going to specifically focus on Jesus, who is our Passover. Our good God, we thank you that in the rich and long history of your people, if we pause and reflect, we can see Jesus. We thank you for the first Passover, that you are a God who is against all kinds of oppression, and that you seek freedom for those who are enslaved. And of course, in Jesus we see our second Passover. We see in Him that it is through Him that we are given eternal life. 
and that we no longer suffer the condemnation of the world around us that is sinking. We see in him that you have broken us free from the power of darkness. And you have brought us into your kingdom of light. And we will never wear the shackles of darkness again. And we see that if Jesus is our Passover, then we must be unleavened bread. Unstained and unspoiled. From the sins and anger that we knew before Jesus, we must be different now. People of, as Paul says, sincerity and truth. So tonight of all nights, we gather here at Christ's table and we say a sacred thank you for Jesus who is and always will be our Passover. Amen. Go ahead and unseal the wafer portion of your communion packet. And I will remind you that on his last night with his disciples gathered there in Jerusalem at what was a Passover meal. Jesus broke the bread, passed it around to his followers, and said to them, every time you do this, you remember that this is my body that is broken for you. So I say to you, take and eat. A little later in that Passover meal, we honestly don't know when, because those who were at the Seder meal know there are actually several times you drink from a cup in a Passover meal. We don't know which one this was. But what we do know is that Jesus changed the words. And he said to his followers there 2,000 years ago, take and drink in remembrance of my life that will be poured out for the forgiveness of sins and for the new covenant, which means the gift of God's Spirit living with us and in us. So I say to you, take and drink. Let's conclude the sacrament, this observance at Christ's table, his Passover table, by praying together aloud the Lord's Prayer. Would you pray with me? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
This is a closing prayer for a service just like this on Monday, Thursday. Let me pray for us. Holy God, we are caught in the tension between light and shadow, death and resurrection. You spoke the world into being, illuminated the universe with your light, and then filled the void with life. Indeed, you have filled darkness and death, the great and empty abyss, with new creation. We look to you in the space between the world and your kingdom, so you can point the way to divine, eternal life, as we wait and long for the fulfillment of all things by the work of your Spirit and in the reign of Christ our King. Amen. Before the benediction, let me ask if you have a spare moment or two, we could use a hand after the service is over, cleaning up from the Seder meal that we had at 6. So just head down to the fellowship hall, and if you have five minutes, I'm sure we will direct traffic, and we will be glad for any time you have to give us. So thank you for that. Our benediction today is from another passage in the Gospel of John that um, talks about Passover. Jesus being our Passover, our freedom. This is John chapter 8, verses 34 to 36. Very truly, Jesus says to us, we are no longer slaves to sin, but children who have a permanent place in God's own house. So if Christ has set us free, we are free indeed. Amen. Would you stand, if able, for the singing of our final song tonight? Jesus commands my death.